Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are talking about the lore of winter, including the dark tales that they don't cover in the holiday movies. And these are the celebrations of the dead. They're the times, the testing of men through the bleak months of winter, and if one is not careful, sacrifice and danger. And we'll be right back to all of the dark shades of winter in just a second. We want to let you know where we can, where you can find us in person in the next few weeks. You can purchase tickets for all of our events at paranormalsciencelab.com. And first, we'd like to thank everyone who came out to the Ritchie Mansion on, in Newtonia, Missouri on this past Saturday. It was a great turnout that really helped to preserve history. On November 19th, we actually have two events. First, in the afternoon, we will be at Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, signing books and talking about everything in the dark Ozarks. And it's free, by the way. And then the night of November 19th, we will be doing a tour and paranormal investigation of the Web City Public Library. Find all the details for the events at paranormalsciencelab.com. And Dark Ozarks t-shirts are now for sale at darkozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. So what is the most shocking thing about the winter tales from lore and from the old beliefs? I don't know. Celebrating the dead, the risk of death yourself, that Santa Claus was really a shaman, or that he may have a dark counterpart, evil twin, if you will. <laughs> Now, that might be too many possible answers. Now, we're going to tell you our favorites later in the show. Let's start uh, there as soon as we give a shout out to our great sponsors that help us bring the Dark Ozarts to everyone. We encourage everyone to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook and their website, alwaysbuyingbooks.com, for all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal, history, and more. Not to mention, the location is haunted. Tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English-style brewery in Missouri and twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, it's also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. So Halloween is filled with lore about concealing yourself from the spirits of the dead. So when do we go from that to celebrating the dead? The old beliefs about winter really start with the day after Halloween. Yes, November 2nd is All Hallows Tide, um, also called All Souls Day for those that are in purgatory in the Christian belief system. But it follows November 1st, which is All Hallows Day or All Saints Day. But the idea is predate Christianity. And in the past, there was a much closer connection to the living. So after harvest, we're transitioning into this time of remembrance and contemplation. But along with that comes a point that we really face our uneasy relationship with the dead. Yes, I mean, it's metaphorical as well as literal. Um, metaphorically, of course, we're dealing with the, the dead of winter and the passing of the harvest and perhaps lean months. But metaphorically, that's one thing. Literally, we still have to figure out how we feel about the dead, even if they are our beloved ancestors. That's a really, that is a really good point. And it is, as we often say with the Dark Ozark, sometimes there are no easy answers. Almost consistently, there are no easy answers. Uh, as I was watching the sunset the, and, the, and the moonrise um, this evening, I was contemplating the fact that the Ozarks consistently refuse to comply considering that I have my windows open and it is 77 degrees on the first week of November. And in so many ways, winter seems a long ways off. But mm -hmm. we both know that is not the case. We are teetering right on the edge where we're going to see a, a, a sudden shift, I, I would imagine. And the Ozarks are unique in the sense that the from a from a uh, from a from a settler standpoint, we are heavily influenced by uh, Scots Irish, 
by Irish, mm -hmm. by German, by Anglo-Saxon immigration uh, mm -hmm. from you know beginning in the 1820s and and prior to the 1820s uh, French yes uh, as well but this is not the upper Midwest this is not New England this is not Canada we are in a in a unique uh, wheel or hub that is essentially upper south transitioning into deep south as you get further into Arkansas and then right on the cusp of the Great Plains. Very true but I, I think that convergence of geography also uh, sets the stage that sometimes we get surprised and we get <laughs> Canadian weather <laughs> blow in and um, one of my you know favorite uh, uh, memories uh, joking about that kind of weather happened a number of years ago uh, when I was supposed to be in court early in the morning and it was a negative 19 with about eight inches of snow on the on the ground and they decided not to cancel court and I couldn't help but rib the every other person that worked in my office for staying in bed while I had to trudge out in negative 19 weather. Uh, but it's, it's just a reminder that winter and perhaps the uh, gods and goddesses of uh, old lore can uh, poke us with a sharp stick every once in a while. Very, very true. And <clears throat> I, it really doesn't seem like it was that long ago. And in reality, it wasn't just a handful of months back uh, as we were, were kicking off the, the 2022 season of Dark Ozarks, that I was sitting on this couch and the house was creaking because it was well below zero and stayed that way for about a week back uh -huh. January, February, along with plenty of snow. And was not the coldest that I have been, but the coldest that I have been for sustained number of days down here. Yes, def definitely. Um, um, and winter just can raise its head that way. And there's no wonder that there's ritual lore associated with it. And something that I, I think is interesting to contemplate, and it's almost a challenge just in terms of uh, retention of lore versus loss of lore. I'm going to mm -hmm. reference back to one of my favorite <clears throat> episodes last winter in regards to uh, history and lore of German <clears throat> settlers mm -hmm. coming into the, into the Ozarks. And in, in many cases, and some of the, some of the social, sociological or anthropo anthropological um, cursory surveys mm -hmm. would go through, talk to a number of people, and essentially, I'm going to paraphrase, say, wow, there, there's no, lots of German last names, but everybody is so ridiculously American, there's no German lore left. Right. There's, there's no German culture. And it is a testament to the uh, Americanizing mm -hmm. of, uh, of various waves of 19th century European settlement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that said, I think that there are also, as, as with my own family, layers of sometimes even unspoken lore, unspoken uh, foods, uh, cuisine, ways of doing things, ways of life, rhythms of life, that a skilled uh, socio-anthropologist could analyze effectively, as opposed to saying, up, oh, nothing to see here, just another Sonic at the corner. Uh, <laughs> And that's <laughs> <Very> true. <laughs> and, and, and my family is the same way, you know, when you start thinking about it. Although I don't think 
to me, most people don't think in those terms or, or just think that everything they do is just like everyone else down the block. Very true. So it's it, particularly in terms of the lore that we're talking about, there are <clears throat> layers of lore that have been temporarily or contemporarily lost as mm -hmm. settlement became highly Americanized, particularly after World War I or during World War I. Yes, there, there, there was a lot of um, white, not whitewashing, but just making things bland to fit in for a lot of immigrants. And, and for sometimes, I, I think for, for positive reasons, sometimes mm -hmm. for negative reasons, there and that said i have to believe that uh, a number of the uh, early immigrant families uh, german families in particular where of course much of our winter lore that we're talking about tonight directly ties to germanic scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon, as well as Scots and Scots-Irish. Yes, Northern Europe, basically. Very, very much, yes. So that, say, the families, the German families coming over to Missouri and to Arkansas in the 1840s would, in so many cases, had to have been bringing this lore with them Mm -hmm. But over the generations, as each following generation became more Americanized, there was more of an adoption of contemporary American holiday culture and a slow erasure uh, or perhaps a more more rapid erasure mm -hmm. of the the original lore. So we do see remnants of of these things particularly in places like the the german settlements in uh in pennsylvania i know carried over some what we think of as as uh, pagan uh or mm -hmm. highly old world traditional uh practices so particularly in relationship to mumming to uh, the mummers mm -hmm. and the and, and the the particular uh particular name for what i classify as peasant krampus as opposed to mountain krampus and i can't think of what his name is right at the moment but he's well known because i think in addition to krampus he showed up on the office at one point on somebody's mm -hmm. sweater <laughs> uh, that but, but, but again is it's variations of the same thing you know yes uh, the the northern uh, Midwest also um, mm -hmm. the area that a lot of this lore uh, remained and remains strong even now. And I I can't help but um, strongly imagine. So it is conjecture, but I suspect we'll find it once you start digging that a lot of this lore was able to be retained in the countryside and the peoples around places like Herman, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I think so, as well as the fact that a lot of this is retained, a lot of these uh, traditions are retained through storytelling, through oral tradition, uh, yeah. just as, as we try to bring things to people right here on the Dark Ozarks, we talk about things that your grandmother would have talked about, your great grandmother, your great grandfather, and that do not get told nearly as often now they don't and and <clears throat> because of the fact that i believe these things resonate within a on an elemental level that these are these are archetypal ideas for those who are familiar with carl jung and these are elemental qualities that you can seal yourself away in a modern society you can seal yourself away but only for so long and only at one's own peril because it it comes with a 
ultimately a, a, a self-imposed ignorance and or a disrespect for the natural universe around us, mm -hmm. the potentially the multiple dimensions, the multiple planes of understanding, the multiple planes of energy that appear to exist, that all universally speak into our experiences because we are part of that process. And when we separate ourselves, as I said, we do so at our own, at our own peril from uh, either becoming blinded to our own, our own selves, or, and or becoming blind to that around us, a lack of respect for the energies around us, a lack of respect in some cases for the natural world around us. And I find it interesting and maybe people might be surprised that there is a long tradition of gods and goddesses associated with winter itself. I think we're used to these concepts with gods and goddesses from the pagan world uh, being associated with certain characteristics or certain emotions. Gods of war, gods of love, gods, you know, goddesses of the hearth those kinds of things. Um, but the mythology and lore that often is taught in school and we discuss a lot, and that tends to be in society, Greco-Roman mythology, doesn't cover a lot of the deities associated with seasons. That's a really good, that is a really good point. And <clears throat> I, I think that our perspective and understanding of paganism and of mythology is not exclusively, but is heavily influenced by Greco-Roman mm -hmm. uh, culture. And even, even to the point, and I, I stand by, we're getting ready to go on a tangent. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> Should I take notes? <laughs> yes. I, I I'm at time, so I understand some of the whys and wherefores because the Greeks and the Romans had the decency to write everything down, and so consequently, we we have a vast body of written lore uh, associated with with Greco-Roman mythology. And as has been noted many times, the, the Celts did not have a written language. And so we are bereft of many stories, not all, because fortunately many were encapsulated within oral storytelling tradition and managed to be preserved at various times uh, really beginning in the 1700s and sometimes earlier, uh, certainly later, thank you, W.B. Gates, uh, but, and, and, and from what we can tell, uh, Welsh literature in the form of the Mabinogion uh, really goes back a long way, mm -hmm. but these are limited compared to the Greco-Roman uh, compendium. Similarly, we see a same issue with Scandinavian lore. We're, we're actually quite, I'm quite grateful for the fact that we, we have comparatively mm, complete Scandinavian works, but predominantly in the prose Edda. And right. we're, we're looking, you know, the Eddas looking at, and, and I find this interesting in, in many cases, that the old world beliefs and, and similarly dating back to around the seventh century uh, in the Germanic, for the Germanic peoples, the Christianization, which was in some cases overlaying the pagan beliefs and in other cases stamping out the pagan beliefs, though the Christian monks, the scribes were typically the only ones writing down 
the belief structure in the form of documentation of culture. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have the pros at us. That's why we have, um, no, fortunately not, the Mabinogian was later than that, but um, I'm trying to think of the Welsh monk who was writing everything down about Ireland. So we have these, uh, the, the, these records, but they are, are not as complete as uh, Greco-Roman. And I forgot what my tangent was, so perhaps it will come back later. <laughs> Did we dodge a bullet? I'm not sure. <laughs> sure you did. Uh, sure you all did. <laughs> Even I don't know where I'm going sometimes. So, Well, uh, so we're kind of talking about gods and goddesses of winter. Uh, yep. There are some common themes across Northern Europe yes. Uh, yes. in this regard. Do you have a favorite? Oh, uh, well... I do find it interesting that in I'm, I'm split between two favorites, uh, a Germanic favorite and a Celtic favorite, specific a Scot Scottish favorite, and in both cases, goddesses. Uh -huh. from, uh, from what we can tell, uh, the Scottish um, lore around the Calach, mm -hmm. and then also a, a winter queen, goddess, crone, maiden. <laughs> goose or duck or duck uh uh figure who comes by many names uh the, the one that i typically hit land on is Berkta uh mm -hmm. or Perkta. but right. there there's she has a number of names within the sort of the the cultural germanic ecosphere and in, in both cases, they're they're very different. I I, I don't see uh, I don't see that anyone could make an effective argument that there's somehow a conflation that there's a common root for these two goddesses. No, but but there is there is a little bit of symmetry as far as the consequences of their action. I guess I would say that's a good point. And that well. And I, I suppose I should, I should, I'll probably have to recant everything that I just said, because we do also <laughs> have, have a weird consistency in the triad goddess mm -hmm. of maiden mother crone. Very true, very true. But uh, this, in, in this connection, the emphasis is more on uh maiden and then crone correct <clears throat> correct and i i think that it is reasonably fair um to for for the the mother aspect uh, of the winter goddess to take a back seat in this regard to to recede because of the harshness of winter it's very difficult to associate the the difficult to survive winter with motherhood that's um, that's true and, and and could come across as fatalistic and, and perhaps bad omens if, if you did is my guess um one of my one of my favorite uh, imagery and motifs that is used is that hiding herself as stones Agreed, and we're, we're this is something that appears to be specific to the Kalach, uh, mm -hmm. to, in Scottish lore. Now, a, a mother aspect of the Kalach is that in, in some bits of lore, she actually created Scotland. Yes, so yeah, so there is a, a that that uh, homage to the third branch of the triad, so. Yes, and for people who might not be familiar, I find it a particularly insightful that the Mother Maiden Crone triad is one person, one mm -hmm. um, multiple aspects of the myth, multiple aspects of the goddess. And 
it speaks to it speaks very heavily to the seasons first of mm -hmm. all it speaks very heavily to aspects of one's personal journeys plural but it also speaks very insightfully and very archetypally into the human experience the larger cycle of birth life and death i i agree and it just to me it, it's just emblemic of incorporating the the trials of the human experience with the seasons as allegory and um and I think you have you it makes the most sense because you have to think of this as being a part coming from Scotland, particularly the mountains, it's often associated with the mountains uh, in the highlands, that this could be a very harsh land with harsh winters. And, and it, so it is it could is. be harsh too. And that it that is also something that we see with so much of of scottish folklore there is a harshness to the lore itself preparing the people for circumstances <laughs> many many circumstances not and not just the the elements of nature but just the history of mm -hmm. the land the history of scotland and well there is there is a, there is a reason that uh, for the for the uh the adage stubborn as a scot and i think it has a little bit to do with that <laughs> I, I i think so as well and <clears throat> there there is there's something that from, from an elemental standpoint and from an introspective standpoint that's very powerful i find this term really really provocative the caliph is a divine hag and ancestor of the land associated mm -hmm. with storms and winter and it, as we dig into these things you find the aspects of in this case what we're calling uh, a goddess to really go beyond our our very simplistic or single faceted perceptions of and i'm i'm not going to sully the more nuanced uh mythological lore that was associated with the greco-roman gods but i am going to sully our simplistic view of these singular personalities the Kalach is vastly more than a single person personality perhaps mm -hmm. having having a bad day throwing a temper tantrum and consequently we get a snowstorm this is grand and vast and terrifying yes and and with a with an interdependent uh, relationship in some respects to humanity uh, one example being that being the source of the right of kings to rule their land um, yeah. um, and i love the imagery and maybe that says something about me but um <laughs> riding a, she rides a wolf holds a hammer or a wand of human flesh and sometimes yeah. attaches human skulls to her clothes which is is certainly um, imagery that we would in modern minds would associate more with Halloween than the winter. Very true, but something that is very important for us to separate ourselves from is the pastiche and the, quite frankly, the the fragile artifice of modernity that is that that we call mm, aspects of our holiday tradition and of course i am living just across the bridge from branson where we have two seasons christmas and not christmas <laughs> and there's of course a lot of 
positives to uh, to existing within the the sphere of a, of an entertainment and tourism center, but at the same time, there is something that is multifaceted and powerful that speaks to a larger human experience. Something that we deal with a lot today when tragedy occurs is the question of, and, and I consider this two sides of the same coin. Oh my goodness, in a, in, a, in a decent, good society, how could this happen? In a Christian society, how could this happen? Or in a modern society, a modern sanitized society, how could this happen? I think our, our much more ancient and in some cases vastly more sophisticated cultures, we would not have found individuals blindsided by the difficulties and the tragedies of life because there was a much more complex and nuanced understanding of essentially the the cosmology of tragedy or the cosmology of suffering and difficulty because life because that's life right and when individuals were brought up with these complexities through the translation of lore mm -hmm. from being having been brought up with these complexities from the time they were old enough to listen to the stories that there was a sophistication in many cases a sophistication of understanding a sophistication of acceptance of tragedy and acceptance of loss a sophistication and a, and a resilience to move forward and you could argue that the scots irish and the german and anglo-saxon settlers brought that resilience with them into a new world and a new land uh, applied it with an increased abundance of provision mm -hmm. and then created what is essentially an unbelievably cushy uh, largely largely caveat disclaimer asterisk uh, hardship free existence in which when bad things do happen we're suddenly blindsided and uh you know a puddle on the floor going i don't understand how this could have happened and in some degrees i have to imagine that our ancestors are looking at us and either laughing or rolling their eyes and and that's a nice that is a nice segue into kind of going back to where we started of celebrating the dead that part of this season of of the dark winter is celebrating the dead and our relationship with the dead particularly our ancestors and i think that that layered and nuanced uh, association with tragedy with hardship uh with the fragility of existence uh had more um, of a communal meaning in the context of there was a reason behind it and the, and the tragedies that have befallen in the past to our ancestors and everything served a purpose and part of that purpose was for them to guide us and to continue guiding us yes and that is something that it appears really began to be lost with the industrialization of Europe, partly mm -hmm. through the Industrial Revolution, the original uh, following post enlightenment that and, and was something that interestingly enough, the Grimm brothers were Wilhelm and, and Jacob were documenting from an anthropological standpoint in the late 1700s, early 1800s in Germany because they were looking at the loss of peasant lore and peasant culture. Mm -hmm. And it would be another 10, 15 years after that, that Germans were settling, for example, Herman, Missouri, and, yeah. and bringing some of that with them, which I find really beautiful. 
and then of course now we're so many years removed that was the old days but there was and i'm, I'm going to make a, a cross tie between appalachia upper south ozarks bluegrass music folk music and then back to uh, ancient germanic uh, paganism so that's going to be a weird circle here we go and something that we see in uh, a lot of of upper south or southern mountain culture was a situation in which there was the ancestral quote unquote the the family homestead in the mountains and the in many cases, when a loved one died, they would be buried right there on the farm. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, we, we were recently at the Ritchie Mansion in Newtonia, Missouri, and literally the family cemetery is 20 feet from the front door. <laughs> yes. In the front yard, not even the backyard, the front yard. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's where you put your family. That's and right something that uh well and, and I'm, I'm gonna you know again i think that many of these traditions are run counter to modernity i remember one of my sister's good friends uh from from high school who was from japan and was honestly quite horrified at the idea of going to a cemetery and walking over dead people because it was it was you know and, and but coming back to the the family you know, I'll, I'll stay on, on i'll stay on task josh will stay on task uh coming to so the these long traditions so for example of uh very sentimental tin pan alley turn of the century turn of the then the 19th to the 20th century sentimental songs which later 40 years later would become bluegrass ballads mm -hmm were often first of all they were often centered around death but they were yeah. often centered around leaving the old home place and having to leave for example a parent or a child's grave behind mm -hmm. and this is a theme that has largely been lost in terms of its heartbreak and tragedy because we have ex as to my knowledge, all but exclusively transitioned to public cemeteries where no matter where you might move to, you will always be able to go back to your loved one's resting place if they're buried in the cemetery. Right. And if you sold the farm, you might not be able to if the, if the new owner doesn't let you. Um, yes. Now, uh, you're right. We, we have lost this. And I think and I think the fact that we've lost this is one reason that um, I'm going to give a, a pop culture uh, context uh, example here. And I think the, because we have lost that connection is why the scene in the movie is so poignant. But in Unforgiven, at the end of the movie, when um, when uh, the the dead wife's mother comes from the East Coast to try to find her family. Um, and all she finds is her daughter's grave um, and some vague stories of where her grandchildren may have gone. Um, I think one reason that that um, has such an effect on the audience is it is a stark contrast to our sense of public burial and public access. Um, I see it a lot in events when, when we talk about cemeteries that have been moved or um, or perhaps uh, repurposed but the body's not moved and just the the hor abject horror that people experience they cannot conceive of this and it's it's a illustration of that and I did not mean to no, you're good. I think that, that <laughs> no, that, that's that. I think that's an excellent addition within that process. And something that was a surprise to me when I started digging in to the research, 
And this ties to Germanic culture. It also ties to Celtic culture in continental Europe. Mm -hmm. Celtic, the many people do not realize that the Celts had for hundreds of years a thriving culture on the north side of the Alps. And many of the things that we know about the Celts comes from Roman accounts interacting, either trading or in combat against Celtic tribes. I was going to say the Romans knew they were there. <laughs> yes, yes. They had uh, just on the north side, of, on the northern slopes of the Alps, the northern facing slopes of the Alps. Incredible region that these ancestral farmsteads had burial mounds of their ancestors mm -hmm. going back time immemorial and the idea that a family homestead might have had that land and been farming that land for century upon century and that these burial mounds of your great 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 grandfather could be outside the back door could be between the house and the barn mm -hmm. and that these burial mounds and the lore associated with the mounds. Now, something that to me is very encouraging and positive and heartwarming is that unlike the cultural uh, chasm that occurred with the much of the destruction, primarily through disease as well as war, of Native American peoples mm -hmm. uh, around the the point of a white settlement, uh, and in addition to and and also I think it it bears a point that there was also a cultural abyss that took place prior to white settlement mm -hmm. uh, or even white involvement because we have, for example, here, the mound builder culture. Mm -hmm. And by the time that white settlement arrives to make records that we have today, the, the interaction was with the Osage who were not the mound builders. Right. And, and the mound builders have been gone for hundreds of years. And yes. So, and we don't know why. We don't right. know. We, we can't speculate. But clearly there was a culture that preceded the Native American cultures that European settlement found. Yes. And that, that previous culture, the mound builder culture, uh, who created... For example, Spiro Mounds, uh, Cahokia, et cetera, so many mounds throughout the vast swaths of Middle America, Middle North America, were gone. And so there, there was a divide. Now, something that seems very consistent with much of Native American lore from, from Osage to Cherokee to Delaware, et cetera, was a deep respect for the existing mounds and understanding that this was a very spiritual place. It was a very important place, but it also with the understanding that that was an alien or pre foreign culture for them. Right. Which they viewed as a, with a lot of supernatural activity going around as well. Yes. And so now coming back to the, that Northern Alpine farmstead mounds that there was not that break there was not that schism schism in in lineage and so you could have as late as the 1700s or 1800s you could still have a family farm that the ancient mounds were still associated with the current landowners and land farmers yeah. that to me that is really powerful and then additionally there's something that happens with that mound lore or the burial mound lore on the farmstead that seems consistently important, but goes against modern sensibility, which is there is a conflation between ancestor spirit, 
well, ancestor to ancestor spirit to poltergeist activity mm -hmm. to grave lights to elves to yeah. house elves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, 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 um, it, it's very cyclical that um, you have the 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 dead the ancestors somehow watching over interacting with the living um, on a very day-to-day -day real sense so that for these people it was not storytelling it was not um folklore it was reality that what could be happening in your house could be related to that you know your ancestors that might go back 50 generations on that land very very powerful stuff and also brings in a couple of interesting things in terms of nuance and i i'm going to jump forward to you know where, where we're going with this and I, I find this deeply challenging, but also really <laughs> wonderful. We have the, this artifice or pastiche image of, for example, Christmas elves. And I, I love challenging individuals with the reality that the, the foundational elements of the Christmas elf is a dead ancestor. Mm -hmm. It's great grandpa. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> and, and now <laughs> there, there's, there's a couple of complex nuances that I really like because once you start wrapping your head around this, you realize that this is a representational of essentially uh, of, a, of a guardian spirit. Mm -hmm. that appears to manifest itself at times in a corporeal way. Mm -hmm. And that the purpose of the spirit being mm -hmm. is to ensure the respect of the farm. Yes, the, the continued integrity physical integrity of the the land and the legacy being passed on continuity and, yes and, and with that comes the importance of respecting the livestock respecting the animals respect respecting the many faceted elements of the farm that have existed since time immemorial and respecting that that not only does it exist but it is well cared for that the 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 animals are well fed that the barn is well kept that the kitchen is cleaned that everything is in order again speaking to uh you know a, a quite frankly a german need for orderly neatness yes that, <laughs> that, I can I can appreciate it probably explains the uh, my my inner dichotomy because I'm I'm part Celt and I'm part German so part also of me, am I, so. <laughs> part, part of me wants everything in order and part of me just constantly creates chaos <laughs> guilty as charged as well so <laughs> it's a it's a unique unique largely american creation and i'm i'm not sure what that says to the larger whole but this uh this idea that if if things are not kept properly there's mm -hmm. going to be hell to pay exactly and you know there's i, I think for for people hearing this and maybe kind of hearing this aspect of of northern europe for the first time, um, an analogy would be how the, the that sort of very popular view in North America is of the relationship of Native Americans to the land. That yes. 
they the Native Americans had had a unique um, tie to the land and respect um, that um, fostered um, prosperity not only for themselves but of the land and animals. Um, but really, this is really kind of the same thing. There, there's Very some similar. strong strong points of correlation and I like that because it speaks to a common a commonality in humanity yes and that I think that it is a misstep to uh, associate more ancient sophisticated practices with individual people groups as opposed to saying, no, if you go back far enough, there, there's, you can see points of, of intersection mm -hmm. from, from many different directions. The, the larger issue, uh, if, we, if we really wanna get um, you know, down to it and make everybody <laughs> mad, uh, we're, we're looking at, at industrialization, we're mm -hmm. looking at modernity and- Urbanization too. Yes, and the 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 what I, what I would classify as the the larger mm, <clears throat> uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? I do have a word that I'm looking for. Um, homogenization yes. of culture and what I would classify as the ethic of industrialization, the ethic of, of conformity. Yeah. And, and those, the, those ethics of conformity have at times picked up various metaphysical and religious elements to get their point across if it was useful. I think that is a, a, an interesting aspect, but mm -hmm. it's what we're, what we're largely looking at is the spread of civilization according to the image of the Roman Empire. And, and the inheritors of the legacy, yes. 100%. The, the idea that the, the, the concept of the idea, uh, as well as the importance of the grid, placing mm -hmm. everything within a grid, which again, has benefits. The aqueducts yes. have benefits. Running water has benefits. Uh, Warming is a wonderful thing. <laughs> yes. So are streets. <laughs> it is. It is. So it's important to understand all of this within a, within a complex, nuanced, complex and nuanced viewpoint. But along with that comes severe homogenization. And it creates, essentially it creates its own weather pattern of ethic. And mm -hmm. we, we see that, we see that applied and the success and structure inherent to it also creates its, its own force of nature, so to speak, from a sociological perspective. And so the, the Roman empire might collapse, but let's face it, the Plantagenets picked it back up and, uh, and then, you know, we move forward to the, to the age of empire Mm -hmm. And we continue to see it perpetuated in various, with various masks. Right. I mean, but it's very, the same principles. And, and the same grid. What they can't get away from is, uh, is the shape. <laughs> the squares. <laughs> <Red angles. laughs> Which brings um, us to the Borg. <laughs> Oh, the Borg with, with snow scattered on it, huh? <laughs> it's <laughs> the Borg inside a Christmas snow globe. Yeah, I like it. Although, um, this does kind of bring us to, I think, the net sort of big motif, and, the, and she's gone by various labels, but I think most people in a, will be more familiar with her in the Grimm Brothers version as a snow witch. Yes. And certainly just in terms of, of a cyclical aspect, uh, Berta, mm -hmm. the snow witch, 
um, or Snow Sorceress, Grimm, Hans Christian Andersen, all of these elements tend to tie together. And modern audiences would be most familiar with C.S. Lewis's work and The Winter Witch of Narnia. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's elements of her in so many of the dark tales that we, we, we like to, uh, to tell and now put into movies. The Huntsman is a recent example that uh, um, it comes from the same lore. Correct. And certainly the, the ice cold evil queen. Yes. Uh, even if there is not a specific winter motif. So referencing back to original Disney animated film, Snow White and the queen mm -hmm. who becomes the crone. Right. Um, and, you know, if you want to go forward, you know, in the adaptation, but certainly uh, in that same vein, would if, if you look at, say, Willow, um, the evil right. queen is, is mm -hmm. certainly that cold, dark queen. So, and I'm, I, I want, I'm very curious as to your thoughts. One, one of our reference points in our material actually comes from FolkloreThursday.com. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, the top 10 snow queens and winter hags from around the world. And they're, they're, the article leads with a contemporary thought which is that, and this is the quote, powerful women are often depicted as dark, cruel, and calculating and associated with winter. Now, to me, this, that is a very um, current contemporary viewpoint mm -hmm. that what I would potentially counter is that our previous, you know, pre-industrialization societies are, are associating, are creating a very deep archetypal motif in regards to winter and that it is perhaps less sophisticated of us to see this as villainous as more as simply reality. That's true, that's true, but you know, from, you know, the lens of the times that we li live in and have lived in for, you know, really since industrialization, I think that strong, you know, and this may make some people mad, but strong women are often seen as a threat. Um, whereas uh, in these traditional tales, that strong woman was necessary. Mm -hmm. She carry, you know, her strength and, you know, whether you want to look at it as cruelty or harshness or rigidity was necessary to get the community or the broader group through the winter. Um, Absolutely. And um, that was, you know, that was expected. Uh, but Again, as you mentioned, as you get to enlightenment and um, uh, and really as the as as the church becomes more and more masculine dominated, that harsh, rigid, strong woman can be seen as a, as a threat. A good example of that would be Elizabeth the um, first. And certainly, you know, portraying herself as a virgin, which certainly, let's realistically, was not the case, um, refusing to marry, um, because it was a way to preserve her standing. Yes. And whereas a thousand years earlier, the idea that the feminine could be strong and rigid was accepted. And, and as, as a part of a multifaceted archetypal whole. 
Yes, that that's one one aspect of a personality. I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. one way to look at the triad is that you have different aspects of a personality. We all have our sides, and and we can certainly have our angry side or our stubborn side when needed, or resolve or soft feminine side, and that's all one person. Yes, and, and, and I think that, <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know, coming coming trying to distill that down to simplify that down Mm -hmm. is is you know what society does that at its own peril it does it's uh simplicity um simplicity often becomes a double-edged sword because people start believing it yes and, and I think one of one of the one of the aspects that b- oftentimes both sides of the of the of the the contemporary argument miss. Mm-hmm. So coming back to this, you know, the this this particular article, um, you know, that the 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 winter witch is depicted as dark, cruel, and calculating. Mm-hmm. A a more sophisticated read on that what could potentially be yes why do you think that's bad right sometimes <laughs> some, sometimes that has that that has has to happen um and if it and it's necessary for the people to survive the winter then you could you could make an argument that not only is it not bad but it is necessary and then take even a further step and say that it is good Mm -hmm. which moves us into that nuance of uh, of understanding and it also starts shedding some light onto aspects of the for example the the grim grim's brothers storytelling in the fact that the quote-unquote cruelty so Mm -hmm. one of the things that is notable about perkta is that if you're a hardworking child, you're you're fine. You might even end up with a with a silver coin in your shoe, right? But if you're a lazy brat, your life's on the line, right? And and what and what people don't realize is that this idea of this of the of the rigid, harsh queen of winter, basically. Uh, we we still reiterate that it comes out of our mouths every year, you know, with, you know, oh, you'll get a lump of coal in your stocking, things like this. Um, this is the origin of these things is that um, you, you, you do your role for the greater group, for the larger group, and you get rewarded. And if not, it, you know, you, you get something you don't want. Now, granted, in some cases, it, it could be uh, as far as slitting bad children's stomachs open and stuffing them with straw, which yes. gives a pure crow a different um, connotation. But I uh, honestly, that's my favorite part of the Berkta legend. Yeah, me too. And and, <laughs> and, uh, and I love telling that at Krampus uh, mm-hmm. and, and consistently, the response from the audience his is horror is horror Mm -hmm. and then now coming back as a a point counterpoint in terms of uh, modern culture versus traditional culture if in a modern horror movie the character is a shrouded half winter goose crone that creeps across shuffles with its giant goose foot shuffles across the 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 floor at midnight uses her magic to uh to enchant the household into slumber and then slits open one of the child children's stomachs empties its his or hers entrails into a bucket stuffs mm-hmm. them full of straw and stones and sews them back up and lets them grow cold and dead in the early morning hour light that's the 
that's the villain. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, that's that's the Freddy Krueger. That's the Jason. Yeah. That's the the, the evil Myers, witch. Yeah. Yes, and without and and this is you know I keep coming back to this idea that we don't have complex nuance in terms of our lore to explain our our to do a better job of explaining the reality around us. That in traditional lore if you're not being a horrible person who is putting your entire community at risk, because that's the implication of the lazy child in this case. Right. That if you are not doing that, this same being might appear to you when you are lost in a snow covered forest and lead you to safety appearing as a young girl. Yes. Um, it also puts a lot more of the onus and responsibility on the person rather than the trope. Um, yes. We, it, our, our modern sensibility is everyone, everyone should be protected. Right. Regardless and yes. any yeah. harm is is horrible um but again it's sort of the carrot and the stick is that there that, you know there are consequences and a lot of our pop culture and our sort of our modern lore uh kind of brushes aside the notion of consequences of your own behavior um what 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 is shown as the horror is suffering consequences of someone else's behavior yeah yeah agreed and and there's, there's that and i think that that comes largely from the the benefits of modernity that's right children don't have don't have to contribute to the household they don't have you know um uh helicopter parenting and endless uh, extracurricular activities are seen as virtues in themselves and and whereas in times past that could have threatened the the survival of the entire family or village depending yes and, and the 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 idea the the two ends of the spectrum of this out of control self entitlement as opposed to if you don't toe the line you are a liability to us all yes and uh, even even though it's difficult like coming back to the story of Hansel and Gretel the idea is that the parents are starving and so <laughs> somebody's got to not eat yeah and in this case it's going to be not the children mm hmm <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and another thing, I, you know, and we've discussed this before, but what a lot of people don't realize about that story is it's ba it is based in historical fact. It's the Great Famine mm -hmm. um, of the 14th century that people were starving. So they did leave people in the in the woods to starve because um, you might get one or two people through, but you're not getting four or five through. Yes. And it's it, it's a horrifying thought. It is a very horrifying thought. Um, but it also uh, counter and counterpoint shows however stressed we may be in our modern society, um, there are very few times that we are faced with the dichotomies that people faced even 500 years ago. Agreed. And weirdly enough for me, there, there's, a, there's a resonating point of hope because quite frankly none of us would be here if our ancestors hadn't managed to survive exactly exactly they somehow came through this and and um, these harsh lessons somehow got us here mm -hmm. and as as also in terms of carrying with us a uh, uh resonating thread of darkness and evil um, a lot of us are here because somebody long ago in the past did something probably really awful to make sure that they were the ones who made it through. 
Yes. Well, and then people don't want to think about that, but you know that happened a lot. It, it had to have uh, mm -hmm. at various points. Yes. Not and, all the time, but at various points, yes. And yeah. and, and oh, you know, the, the, just the <laughs> idea that all, you know, at, at, at these points, at these points that oftentimes we're looking back very nostalgically and sentimentally and saying, oh, couldn't we get back to this time? And for me, it's usually talking about the fact that there was more sophisticated mm, cosmology at work. At yeah. the same time, people in those times, if they were forward thinking, we're going, how on earth do we make things better so we are not struggling just to survive? How do we how do we make things easier each generation? How do we make things easier to get us to this point today? And perhaps my takeaway you know, in a larger sense is enjoy and embrace modernity and, and all of the comforts of that, but not let myself get too comfortable, still push myself uh, um, avoid a sense of self entitlement. Remain as humble as possible. Work as hard as possible, and you know, and and try to develop a a complex and reasonably accurate cosmology. Yes, and and that's all we can do. I mean, yeah. in, in in the in these contests. Speaking of being reflective and um, uh, nostalgic, how about Krampus? My favorite winter Christmas demon. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and for people who might wonder, yes, I have several, but Krampus tends to be at the top of the list. That <laughs> and I can vouch for this. Yeah, I know you can. And I, I, I have a special place in my heart for Krampus. And in part because, mm, I'll let y'all in on a little secret, I, sometimes I am Krampus. Yes. <laughs> and and when, I, when I open my closet right next to my Cronunos antlers, Krampus is usually looking at me. So there's that too. But... Krampus, Krampus is heavily misunderstood, not heavily, not misunderstood within the context of our conversation this evening, but misunderstood mm -hmm. in the larger, uh, a larger mm, conversation uh, and is existing, fortunately, or I would say fortunately, has, has begun to penetrate into pop culture, into mm -hmm. sort of the, the milieu of consciousness. And it, really, because really, even saying a demon is a, is a bit of a misnomer. It is, and I, and I think the pop culture um, <clears throat> visualization right now is that he is a demon. Very, very correct. And as much as I love the film, and I do love the film, uh, it is folklorically inaccurate. Yeah, it, it does get in. It's very well done. One of my you might, favorite. You might films. you might give the the title if people aren't familiar. I, and I'm trying to remember. It isn't it just Krampus? It's either Krampus or Krampus not. I can't remember. Yeah. I, I I don't either. I've only seen it once. Um, yeah. But and, and I don't actually have the film myself. I don't either. Uh, actually, I got to go to the Ghostbusters of the Ozarks and uh, in Christmas of 2019 and watch the film in their backyard. Oh, cool. <laughs> Which was really, really fun. So big shout out to Ghostbusters of the Ozarks. They're awesome. Yes, they are. And, but the, uh, a lot of the, the, mis the misconceptions about the lore for Krampus are encapsulated. I don't think they're, they're not mm, created by the film. No, but they, they are encapsulated by the film in that is Santa's evil twin. Basically, he's uh, yeah. for those of you who are familiar with Disney Afternoon, he's Negaduck. Um, the <laughs> huge Darkwing Duck fan, just throwing that yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. um, late 1980s, if I didn't get to watch Disney Afternoon, I turned into Negaduck, much to my mother's <laughs> chagrin. <friend>. So <laughs> We wonder why you like Krampus. Yeah, I know. And that 
rather than rather than uh, mm, ra- rather than a, a evil twin or uh, like the the evil side of Santa, I I think it's important to understand that it is a counterpart to Santa. Yeah. Uh, that they that they balance one another kind of like the, the batman and joker yes i think that's <laughs> excellent with a with an interesting love hate relationship yes <laughs> <laughs> and and honestly what would joker be without batman um and vice versa and yeah and uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> I just figured out what happened. We we separated, we separated Santa from Krampus, and what happened? Santa got fat. <laughs> I don't even know what I don't even know what to say to that. So fair, fair. <laughs> but. <laughs> And and for anybody who you let me speechless, that doesn't happen often. <laughs> anybody who wants to follow the analogy through, without Joker to keep Batman on his toes, Batman would get fat. So fair. And it's hard to fight crime that way. So there you fair. go. Um, <laughs> but but something that we do see is, of course, there, there's a lot of really interesting layers of generational lore associated with Santa Claus. Yes. And the older iconography of Santa Claus, and I'm for, for popular culture reasons, I'm just going to refer to him as Santa Claus, as opposed to the many different names associated with Santa Claus. Yeah. That mm, post-war Krampus absent Santa is consistently happy and jolly and round and never has a bad day. Mm-hmm. But if you if you start digging into the iconography of earlier versions of Santa, he is not round. He is uh, powerful, but shrouded oftentimes a little terrifying. I still remember the first time that I went into a, it was actually, it was actually the Covered Wagon Craft Store in Chillicothe, Illinois, and they had a series of traditional European Santas hand-painted. Mm-hmm. And my mom looked at him and was like, uh, he's scary. And, and she was right. Uh, Santa of that era, of those, those previous older generations, was a little terrifying at times and you can make some and we will some important cross ties to odin mm-hmm. with with that tie-in uh, or woden if you're germanic right. and that at this point this juncture point the companionship of for example woden and krampus start to make more sense Mm -hmm. agreed that and then as as this alpine lore became christianized Mm -hmm. then we start seeing an overlay of christian cosmology in terms of how do we make these existing characters fit Right, which I mean, and is certainly not isolated to these characters. It happened to oh, no. a number, <laughs> pretty much all of Europe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And and, and I, I also, it, it's perhaps a little simplistic, but I still love to joke that Krampus really tells us everything we need to know about the German psyche, and I say that as being having a lot of German heritage myself. That in and in, in other. Uh, bits of lore if you're a naughty child Santa might give you a lump of coal and in the case of Krampus if you're a naughty child Santa just hands you over to Krampus and Krampus is and I'm going to use the post-Christian iconography 
iconographic overlay in what I'm about to say, which is Santa hands you over to Krampus and Krampus is a goat headed demon who whips the child, wraps them in chains, throws them into his own satchel and then packs them off to hell never to be seen again. So don't be naughty. Yeah. You know, be good little boys and girls. <laughs> yes. The, and and uh, Krampus appears not to be, you know, gender discerning. He seems just like with, uh, right. with Perkta. It's uh, if you are lazy and bad, the punishment is going to be severe. And, and there's parallel, you know, you can see sort of uh, some similarity between those two characters as well. Oh, know, very they, much. They serve, they serve the same purposes in some ways. Um, they, they do. Uh, and, whereas, but Krampus is, I think, intended to scare before the fact more. <laughs> yes, and who wouldn't be? Krampus is often, <sighs> Uh, accompanied himself is, is is has his own entourage of mm -hmm. forest spirits mm -hmm. and the the at a point of convergence uh Berkta really does in many ways personify mother maiden crone mm -hmm. in in various aspects and a, a more beautiful aspect of her uh personage is associated weirdly enough with bees mm -hmm. the the idea that in the in the dead of winter if you hear the sound of swarming bees which of course bees are not going to be out swarming in the dead cold of winter but the the iconography of their imagery of this is that it the bees the sound of the bees herald Berkta, and there is a a forward-looking aspect that essentially paying homage to Berkta will allows you to look forward into the coming spring, into the light right. of dawn, into the future. Right. Uh, Krampus Where, doesn't have that. No, no, they're, 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 Krampus is the here and now. <laughs> Krampus is, is, is the here and now, and Krampus is also um, very associated with ancient fertility festivals. Yes. And along with the entourage of Krampus. Yes. And that and that is associated. So there, there's there's a lot of essentially in, from a very traditional standpoint, uh, very ribald uh, festivities associated with the coming of Krampus. And and I think that it, it effectively speaks into the human experience. And in some ways, may emphasis on may structure and encapsulate natural human uh you know processes and urges in a way that if you simply ignore them they they may not have an effective uh outlet yes you know and and i think i think that that you know that that is that is um actually one of those ironies of modernity is that we we feel that we are more cosmopolitan and open and so on and so forth. But in a very real sense, we don't talk about those things near as much as they as in the past. I mean, it's it's like the sort of the um, image of the Victorians as being prudish, which is actually just the opposite. Um, and but it seems as we go along that we we repress uh, that side of human nature, um, telling ourselves that we're sophisticated and that it's part of being modern. But um, there are consequences, and 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 some of the things that we uh, complain about in society are consequences of ignoring these things. It which is which Krampus does it. <laughs> no, and that's one of the things that I, it, it's, it's why Krampus is one of my favorites. Uh, and Krampus really faces these fears and these issues head on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Unflinchingly. 
and it's kind, kind, kind of like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre of European lore. I, I think that is very, very effective. I think that is very fair. And as we were talking, it, it reminds me a little bit about a, a character that we do not have on, on our notes, uh, but is one, one of my personal favorites is the Mari Lloyd. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the Welsh, the singing Welsh horse skull. Yes. In, in a shroud. Mm-hmm. that gets drunk and goes door to door singing things caroling yes yes a very interesting and effective aspect of caroling and also uh, you know we're, we're coming off of halloween but i think this reminds me of something was having having conversation actually during the last um uh, farmer's market with with an individual who made what I think is a very astute point saying we always talk about how the the current generation of youth are the the worst so to speak without looking back that it wasn't that that Halloween of not very many generations ago was full of actual pranks Mm -hmm. that uh could take a pretty, you know, move, transition very quickly into severe vandalism. Yes, and, and damage, you mm-hmm. know. And, and to the point that a, a much more, and, and we're talking 1950s, 1940s, 1930s, you know, the, the good old yeah. days when everyone was supposed to be super buttoned up and really ethical, and the idea that that not in some cases not giving out treats at at halloween might have real consequence exactly and again that's something that isn't even contemplated now no and you know trick-or-treating is is one of my favorite times i always make a point to stay home and hand out candy and and all the and since you know i've been here in this neighborhood since 2012 Mm -hmm. uh, and every single kid who's ever come to my door has been like the nicest oh yeah that you could possibly imagine and that includes all the way up to the teenagers on dates which i'm like here have some more candy uh i'm i'm one of those people (laughs) (laughs) i just think the the entire um the entire concept is really awesome and what honestly if like if you're a couple of teenagers and your date night would be to be trick-or-treating like you were kids I honestly think that's like the sweetest thing in the world just throwing that out there I mean I do too I mean and people who who think that teenagers shouldn't I think it, I think it's kind of foolish um, same token I think if if you know, when a little kid, if kid said or a teenager said trick or treat and you said no treat, I'm not sure how many now would even know what the, what, okay, now what? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> there. That, that there, there, there yeah. is a social contract there that, uh, you know, that it has to be a treat and the, even the uh, idea that someone doesn't adhere to that just elicits a does not compute response at this point and and again it's not that long ago that uh you know people had their houses torn up you know vandalism etc outhouses outhouses tipped over moved into yeah i I, I i saw a story um in the last few days for halloween and it was a clipping from a newspaper it it was 1907 and this this had this happened they had actual photos of it that um as a, as a trick um teenagers had put wagons on top of seven different houses and i think it was somewhere in ohio if i remember right and <laughs> and the That's article was, and the article was you know uh wondering how in the world they managed to do that but it was done (laughs) 
so and the idea of someone putting your car on top of your roof <laughs> yeah yeah so i don't know i i think that there's a lot of positives to our modernity if we can mm -hmm. manage to keep ourselves from becoming self-encapsulated yeah. in, in in simplicity i agree um solstice the yule oh well of course we're on the countdown yes we are absolutely on the countdown to to the solstice the the, the winter solstice which is december 21st approximately mm -hmm. and there, there's an enormous amount of lore probably we'll, we'll continue this discussion more there, there's a vast body of lore associated with this yeah but it is the, the essentially the death of the sun mm -hmm. and then the rebirth of the new sun and I don't know, you know, a lot of parallels there to ancient Sumeria, ancient Egypt, and, um, you know, that people probably don't want to think about, but, um, and it goes to, you know, part of that goes to the fact that there was a lot of interaction between societies, even yes. thousands of years ago, and then how they ended up interpreting each other's lore gives us a rich a rich mythos it does <clears throat> and one of one of the mm, benefits slash risks that we take in, in terms of analysis is how closely we interpret those connections as opposed to the risk of not tying any connection whatsoever. Right, I think there's a correlation. I think, of course, part of that correlation is that peoples all over the globe um, were very interested in of marking time, marking the seasons, progression of planets and stars, et cetera. And so, Part of it is coincidental. People notice the same things, but I think I think there's value to say there is a similarity in this culture story with this culture story because we tend to put everything into boxes, and we do. We and do. nothing in this box ever affected that box, and and, <laughs> and that's not necessarily true either. Right. It's I, I think coming back to our, our, our consistently appreciated and effective tagline, sometimes there are no easy answers. Mm -hmm. This really ties, these are very, very complex threads. They, they are, and but it is certainly a part of the dark winter. It is, and I remembered my tangent, so I'm fixing to start a fight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, I have no idea what's coming. <laughs> I know you don't. Uh, it's not in our notes. So, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm actually approaching this from a fairly open mind, but at the same time, questioning how simplistic the connections are, beginning with the 1930s into 1940s Gardnerian Wicca and its association with something that is consistently associated with uh, British, the British foundations of Wicca is Celtic, the Celtic elemental cosmology. Yes. Which is appropriate, I think, considering its, its origin points. Yeah. At, at the same time, there is a constant tie-in uh, to the cult of Diana, Mm -hmm. And a constant tie-in to Hecate, the, mm -hmm. the goddess of crossroads. Yeah. And on one hand, you can make some effective arguments when you look at 
the impact of Roman Britain. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that if you are transitioning over to Irish as a, as a core, it is much more difficult to make those arguments because the Irish were consistently resistant to Roman influence. Yes, the same with the Scots. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, it was a... Was that an arrow I just heard across the Hadrian's wall? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, when you, when you look at traditional, and by traditional, I mean pre-Christian mm -hmm. Ireland and pre-Christian Scotland, to me, although you can assume there was some trade, it, yeah. is it is very difficult for me to conceptualize heavy religious cross-pollination of ideas into those spaces. Now, Southern yeah. Britain and Wales is obviously a very different story. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely correct and, and very much uh, analogous to Scandinavia. Um, you know, the, the inroads into Scan uh, Scandinavia by Christianity certainly came much later as well. Um, yes. And um, just the further north you were, it seemed that it, it, there was a resistance. But and it that though those elements of resistance and the um, comparative isolation of mythos mm -hmm. makes me not want. Here's my. I'm, I'm. I'm getting to my point. Makes me not want to tie too neat of a connecting line oh i agree between what we think of as essentially celtic witchcraft uh and i say that term quite lovingly in relationship to old ireland and old scotland to for example the cult of diana or hecate and that yeah. it is something that i will throw out there as as a point of contemplation that don't my 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 point of reference is to say or point of introspection and reference is to say don't be too hasty to draw one-to-one -one ratio lines between these elements because we're dealing with highly sophisticated and semi-isolated cultures yes no. That's. I think that's. I. I, I think. I think that's as accurate as as we can be, and and makes the most sense when you look at it. That. So I'm. I'm actually rather. I'm, <laughs> I'm relieved by my own tangent. I was not sure where I was going with that. I, so. <laughs> there was a point in there, in the end. <laughs> there, there really was. So, and and, <clears throat> but I do. I. I consistently at times we'll see the these what i feel like are one-to-one -one ratios that are tying things like beltane to uh to honestly to to um ancient phoenician and canaanite yeah. religion and i i was listening to someone who kept repeatedly saying that and i'm going i'm i'm I struggle to to make that direct connective line. I agree. Now, now there certainly may have been a similar festival or a similar yes. right uh, along the same time period of the year, but mm -hmm. yeah, a direct correlation um, is is kind of hard to hard to draw and i think one thing too people don't really i think now usually when people think of yule they usually actually think of new year's um and new year's eve Interesting. But, you know um yeah I, I hear i've heard people discuss that you know um but it really runs from the solstice until what, january 5th 6th 6th 
yeah to, yeah, to, what, yeah. to now and and something that's actually very handy mm-hmm. is that uh the catholic holiday calendar overlays on the the old world pagan calendar so yeah. and, and we see that with, we see that with halloween we see that with epiphany um mm-hmm. uh, etc and you know i think that it in uh saint nicholas day uh, yeah as well uh, etc mm-hmm. so lots of lots of correlative points on that but in the larger sense if people are saying why why is this happening at this time as opposed to that time it, it is based on the celestial calendar it is it is now it it you know some things have been shifted slightly mm-hmm. um and observed at different times um particularly in the church calendar for various reasons and a lot of it church politics but um you know but it is a good rule of thumb mm-hmm. and you know so i think it's especially when we get into this portion of the year and this might be kind of a, a decent place to begin to conclude but a space the the dark season mm-hmm. is autumnal equinox to winter solstice to vernal equinox yes and the uh the 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 even point between autumnal equinox and winter solstice is halloween yes and the even point between winter solstice and vernal equinox is immol yes and so realizing that and, and you know how anyone wants to translate this is it is you know up to personal opinion but the reality is it it, it is it, it first of all it speaks to societies that were so very sophisticated as to understand exactly where the sun and the moon were exactly at any given time and that is unequivocal we have multiple locations stonehenge being one of the most obvious but multiple ancient locations that are lined up as as solar calendars yes and and it just makes the most sense too i mean yes And, and when an understanding of this cycle is what you're basing your survival on to know when to plant crops when to to have your livestock begin to calve and this in your entire culture survival is based upon this it becomes pretty obvious that it's important exactly and Coming around to kind of where we started about celebrating death and celebrating the dead, we have Alphabot and Disablot. Which I I really love the Alphabot. And there these are again coming back to something that seems to be very consistent with Northern European lore, which is the conflation of ancestor burial mound spirits with elves yes and it 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 does take a sudden dark twist because now i'm going to throw this out there and the next thing i know i'm going to have inadvertently spawned an incredibly horrible cheesy christmas horror movie which is christmas elves and blood sacrifice I like it. (laughs) (laughs) That's very true. I mean, um, you know, because I think I think that I think that veneration of the dead is something that people don't really expect, and especially I even as a rite of of winter. But that's what this was about. Um, And the these two rituals, one was was male one was feminine one Mm -hmm. was sacrifice and one was offering now 
in our in our 21st century Western assumptions, we might assume that the male uh, ritual was the sacrifice and the female uh, ritual was offering, but it was just the opposite, actually. <laughs> <laughs> which, which kind of that to the cruel the cruel winter queen very true and i think that's an interesting point uh of analysis i i the the idea and this is it is a somewhat shifting idea of the elves mm -hmm. but one of the things that it seems to be very consistent is that the elves were powerful yes and they were powerful they also uh commanded um supernatural powers yes and uh certainly in enchanting powers over man and the the idea that that there is a close connection with the ancestors Interestingly enough, a close connection with fertility and mm -hmm. with blood. Yes. So, and oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, these are these are difficult themes. Uh, quite frankly, all three are difficult themes for modern people to wrap their heads around. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it, not begin, beginning it's with not nice and neat. No, it's it's pretty messy, actually, as life is. And the the terms Alphablot and and Disablot, these appear to be well, this is very Scandinavian, but yeah, Northmen. And I and I'm saying that, you know, you know, we, we tend to say Norsemen, but the men of the north, basically. Yes. Uh, but from what we can what we can ascertain currently with the mm, <laughs> <laughs> the tradition of Christmas and Christmas elves in association mm -hmm. with uh, Northern continental Europe, as well as some Anglo-Saxon uh, lore. Mm, even though we're dealing the, the contact, the information that we have is specifically Norse, Scandinavian Norse, it appears to have some cultural spread into yeah. continental Europe. Yes. And, um, Basically, the, the Athelot, which was the the male half of the of the of, the, of these two ceremonies, was an offering of blood, often over burial mounds. Yes. Um, and you know there is some conjecture that at some point in the distant past that the the offering of blood was maybe a part of actual bur burial custom um, at some point, and not just a uh, a seasonal ritual but then the sort of the yin and the yang the other right the, the distant block um was a was a, a sacrifice um and uh it, in particularly for um it was also known as the blood of blood to the elves at mm -hmm. times but um, it was to appease the spirits of your home, of local spirits and ancestors' um, souls. Um, is is uh, the, these two ceremonies were were meant to honor and appease these groups they are and something that is really striking to me and this is heavily shamanic yes and i guess it's it, we and one thing i find interesting too is that with the norsemen the northmen that shamans typically were women correct and seers which um is often uh common with all of northern europe seers in the Celtic tradition often were women um then um point and counterpoint you have shamans in this tradition performing these sac these sacrifices 
for the dead, for the spirits. And then when you travel a little further east, still very north, but northern eastern Europe, um, Santa Claus himself and shamans get intermixed and perhaps have an origin with each other. Yes, and that is <clears throat> real, real quickly. A, a as I, as I'm reviewing the Alpha Blood and the Disa Blood, um, mm -hmm. giant screaming disclaimer: Don't try this, and thus you know what you're doing. Yes. Um, yeah. that one, that one is really, really important to do. Yeah. And second, there, there is a Scandinavian connection because as, as you're referencing the, many of the elements of the, the imagery associated with modern day Santa Claus are associated with potentially the Sami the yeah. northern Finnish uh, shaman practices. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then very similar things uh, over into the Rus, what we know as Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and these typically would be male shamans, um, but they tended to have a certain look. Yes, and, and an appreciation for red. Yes, wore red, hats trimmed in white, and also some supposition that that is also an allusion to the fact that the shamans use psychedelic mushrooms. Yes, specifically the species of mushroom that is the red. cap is red with white white dots. <laughs> yes, and often when they would come to a home to provide assistance to someone um they were associated with the chimney right and it, it was that was that associated in the sense of the the magic of the hearth i i think i mean there 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 are some references that that they would they would arrive on the roof actually mm. yeah and and so my my uh, my guess would be that perhaps some some of the ritual will be performed over the chimney in the mm -hmm. chimney smoke, but I don't know. That's just okay. conjecture. Uh, but the, but yeah, sources do indicate that suppose they would arrive that they would arrive and people would know they arrived because they would be on the roof. Right. This is Santa Claus arrives in his sleigh on the roof. Yes, <laughs> and of course reindeer. And reindeer in the uh, Finnish Lapland. In northern yes. Russia. Yes. And you just hope the reindeer were eating the mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which or might be why. <laughs> <That's... laughs> <laughs> Hallucinogenic reindeer. <laughs> do your reindeer fly? They're positive they do. Yes. Just ask them. <laughs> just ask them. <laughs> But I think I think a lot of people would be surprised to at the notion that, you know, uh, our jolly elf Santa Claus has a lot more to do with magic and shamanism than uh, Christmas carols. That is true. And that is true. And it is also fair that and as i think that we we we've noted we'll continue to note throughout this season is that i i i love this stuff I do too. Uh, is that so much of uh the american christmas tradition is informed by many many different strands of ancient european culture specifically ancient european culture Yes, and particularly Northern European. Uh, agree, very much so. And there, there are consistent elements, Scandinavian, German, uh, or Germanic, um, Finnish, Anglo-Saxon, and, uh, and, and to some degree Celtic mm -hmm. um, bits and pieces, particularly in terms of mistletoe. Um, and, Throw, throwing that out, the, the, the Celts gave us uh, veneration and mistletoe. So, yep, that's true. 
<laughs> that might be a, a fairly good place to, to kind of end that for today. But we yes. want to remind everyone, don't forget to check out upcoming events at paranormalsciencelab.com. Thank you again to Always Buying Books and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping bring the Dark Ozarks to everyone. And on our next episode, we're going to be discussing what's scary. Uh, this is our send-off to Halloween. So tell us what you think is scary in the Ozarks, now or in the past, paranormal or not paranormal. And we want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarks. <laughs>